Okay, merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, Hello enfin, everyone. Welcome. My name is Juliette Seban. I am the executive director of the IFD, and we are very happy with my teams to welcome you for this event one and a half years after its launch. So the idea of this event is to talk about our uh, our institution and talk about uh, our projects and what we want to do with our funding. You will hear from a certain number of projects which have been uh, supported by FID. We have a certain number of uh, um, people who have been involved in this project who are with, her, with us here in the room or uh, online. And so uh, we will be talking about all these projects to fight uh, poverty and inequality. We have a certain number of people in uh, the room who had a certain number of uh, projects who are in the room online. We won't be able to talk about all the projects. I can also see in this room a certain number of people that I recognize, people from uh, research, uh, from uh, um, abroad also. And it's a great uh, thing that we were able to meet with all of you here today. So thank you very much for all the people um, for their support, especially this first year and uh, more specifically the members of our exco who are here with us today so we will spend two and a half years uh, two and a half hours sorry together uh, until half past six and so uh, we won't have a lot of time to do q a but the people from fid who are here today will um, answer any questions you may have online and we'll take the time to discuss with you after this event and without further ado I would like to hand over to Esther Duflo, uh, who is uh, so uh, 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 who is one of the founding members of uh, FID. Um, she is a professor uh, at MIT, and she tries to understand the economic life of uh, most vulnerable people, and um, she works on uh, having an impact on the various policies to help these people. She uh, was the winner of the Nobel Prize uh, in Economics in 2019, and she's also chair of our board of directors. Esther, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much um, for being here. Um, to share for some of you, to hear from others. When uh, Juliette told me about this idea for the first time, I must say I was very happy, but I was also quite uh, worried because uh, I wondered who would want to come and talk about um, our institution. And so I'm really, really happy to see so many people in this room. It means that uh, many people are interested uh, in what we do. So I think uh, you made the right choice uh, coming here today as beyond um, IFD itself and there's projects that you will hear from. I think, or I hope, should I say, that the idea of uh, FID um, is, let's say, it is set in this context of need to review international cooperation. To just to say a few words about the, the context uh, about cooperation, especially um, between uh, the poorest countries and countries such as France. Well, a certain number of um, elements of context that have quite changed. If we take the moment when we started this cooperation, decades ago. So to start with, well, there is um, the international um, growth, which is a good thing. And many, many people, um, poor people, people from the south, uh, countries from the south, uh, have seen their budgets uh, increase, their resources increase, their uh, technical abilities uh, increase even if there still is um, a lot that needs to be done in uh, many cases. And they are also um, capable now of um, 
unlocking more capabilities. And, uh, well, there are a certain number of very small countries that are extremely poor, which uh, are still in a very, let's say, uh, very complicated situation, a certain number of countries in Africa, namely, and for which um, the support that comes from outside is more important than their own budget. But um, generally speaking, and if we take Africa, I mean, it's less than 15% um, of exterior help in the budget. So this is um, not, uh, it is not nothing, but it means that 85% of the budgets comes from the country itself. So that's really a great thing. Then another revolution I want to mention is the, let's say, the, 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 the a certain number of uh, countries, so the, the BRICS countries to, to name them, um, spending a lot of money in trade-related uh, projects or cooperation-related projects hence creating competition with more historic countries who were involved in cooperation, the former colonies, colonizers. So there therefore is a potential, this was quite clear before COVID appeared. Um, we saw this, this, this low, evolution or this slow evolution um, towards a um, towards less and less cooperation i, I remember a certain number of uh, let's say uh, uh, times where people wondered okay if uh, this support was good or not but um at some point in time what well, we have to recognize that uh, the support is perhaps not relevant anymore. And, and this leads me to talk about uh, one of it. Oh yeah, international cooperation, um, especially when it comes from uh, countries such as France or the EU or the US, right? It allows us uh, to intervene on certain number of actions which other countries cannot be involved in. If we take uh, countries such as uh, uh, China, for instance, or who won't necessarily have the willingness to do so. And so, uh, and, and, and to, 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 to perhaps focus on this potential of cooperation, this requires us uh, to focus on uh, three um, uh, topics. And I want to talk about cooperation rather than aid because uh, it's more powerful. And so I believe we should concentrate it on three main uh, topics. And so the one, the first is, is the capacity of uh, countries to borrow large sums of money in a very fast fashion. Uh, we saw this during COVID. Um, countries who were able to in a very fast and efficient way to raise money. Um, so in countries such as France and the US, this um, made it possible to come up with this social protection system, which was extremely efficient. Uh, and without increasing the, num the, the, the level of poverty uh, in a significant way. And that in the poorest countries, the, the the, sh the share of uh, tax stimulus uh, in GDP was only of 2%. So this is much less than uh, other countries. So we see there is a big, big gap. So where does this difference come from? If we take Togo, for instance, Togo cannot um, borrow money um, abroad um, other than via the IMF or other um, recognized donors especially when it comes to supporting its economy um, during a crisis such as COVID. So I believe that uh, one mechanism that still is available to countries such as uh, France or even more so uh, the EU or let's say a global cooperation, it's the capability to 
intervene on a, on a financial uh, level in a very substantial way. So it wasn't done during COVID, certainly not to the extent of what was necessary. And this is not necessarily uh, because there was no willingness, it's because there was no financial mechanism available. So we spent uh, months talking about this and that and how to allocate uh, the various um, funds available. But in order to perhaps be prepared for the next crisis, we should come up with the pipes, you know, which will allow us to ensure uh, that uh, Togo uh, can uh, spend 25% of its GDP for exceptional measures in an exceptional context, the same way uh, we uh, did it in other countries. And the thing is that because of climate change, namely, um, these exceptional events will become less and less ex exceptional. So this is the first thing. Then the second um, topic uh, on which we need to work and for which uh, I believe that international cooperation cannot be replaced. It, this is the support to share um, global public wealth. So following the war, uh, we saw a reduction of um, uh, the death rates of uh, newborns uh, due to a better sharing of the so-called global wealth. So uh, this was namely in the, we saw with the improvements in the health uh, means resources. Um, we saw this uh, with a number of examples uh, here and there. Uh, and we, we, we talk here about uh, global um, shared wealth, right? This is cooperation that we're talking about. And so in uh, this uh, context, one of uh, the so-called uh, global shared wealth um, is innovation and not only technical or technological innovation, so uh, smartphones and so on, but innovation with regards to processes, innovation with regards to policies and how to ensure that a country has the right political approach, especially a country that spend a lot on health uh, expenditure. And in order to do so, we've seen a social innovation, an innovation at the level of processes, and this can be supported, not imposed, but supported, launched, supported, monitored, and this would allow if we use the lessons that we've learned elsewhere, this would allow us to come up with um, a new uh, a new sort of common global wealth, which would be knowledge, common knowledge. And what we've seen since the beginning of the 90s of the last century is this more and more pragmatic approach in many, many more countries, be it in Africa or in uh, South Asia, um, regarding very concrete issues uh, um, when it comes to um, child deaths, uh, mother deaths and so on. And in many, many countries, and, and namely uh, following the international decision that was made to uh, focus on the Millennium Goals and then on the SDGs, um, and then also with the development and the sharing from one country to the other uh, of technologies, of efficient ideas, that could be quite simple, right? But, but had proven to be efficient. So uh, the development of how to uh, implement um, a ambulance system in Sri Lanka, uh, which was then uh, passed on to uh, neighboring countries. Uh, so, so FID wants to intervene, especially for this third um, topic or issue. And uh, it wants to, we want this to be used as a key element supporting innovation. And what FID is trying to do is trying to fund 
the capabilities of countries to innovate, to take risks, to assess uh, their innovation in order to come up with innovative solutions uh, to make way uh, for those that are efficient and uh, uh, and, and and, and no longer concentrate on uh, innovation that uh, does not uh, work. So FID was an initiative of uh, French president. Um, it was announced in December of 2020. Um, and it is uh, set in a context so following, namely, so the, the end of 2019, discussions that were um, launched by Hervé Berville, who should have been with us today, but couldn't be because he's in Parliament. Anyway, um, FID is an independent institution. Uh, it is governed by a board of directors, which uh, I am the chair of and uh, it is hosted by the French Agency for Development, AFD. So uh, they have us a lot when it comes to the choices we make for allocating funds and so on. But the decisions that we make are independent. And the um, funding mechanism um, is unique in the French uh, system. And uh, we will talk about this again when uh, when the um, project holders uh, tell us about their projects. But it is a funding uh, system which uh, functions, let's say, uh, alongside so-called venture capital, um, business solutions, um, and it is more or less the equivalent for uh, public policy approaches. And so all are funding choices are 100% subsidized. We have a 15 million euro annual yearly budget. So we start with uh, prep funding, so small amounts which allow uh, the project owners to work on preparing their project. Then we have a certain number of steps. So we have step one with the pilot uh, uh, step. And then we have step two where we do the scaling of the project. Then the uh, step, stage three, which is uh, the the replicating and transition. Right? Uh, one very specific mandate is uh, uh, fighting poverty uh, and inequality in order for the policies doing so be more efficient. And so even though we fund uh, projects and the implementation of these projects, we do not fund a project just for the project itself, but we fund the project for its potential, its potential to show us a new way which can th then be used by others. So what this means practically is that in the first stages, well, we will uh, fund a trial because we believe it makes sense. But as soon as we enter stage two, we want a very thorough evaluation, which shows credible results, which will then lead us uh, to making uh, the right decision. So, uh, so far we see projects that work or not, but knowing that a good idea has, uh, let's say, or uh, has a certain number of problems for the employment. It's implementation, it's scaling, but nonetheless, is a good idea. Well, this is uh, obviously uh, something good for, for FID, right? Um, even though we, let's say, count the number of people that uh, we were able to serve uh, in, the, the, in, in, in the frame of a project, which has been, uh, which has proven to be efficient, right? Uh, I have worked uh, with a number of people who did not benefit from any support, even though they had proven that uh, their projects were good. But I mean, that's that's life. I mean, uh, we have to uh, learn uh, as fast as we can how to, let's say, protect in a way our projects. Anyway, one year uh, after 
it was created, we have attracted many, many uh, projects. We had a priority for African uh, countries, which are a priority for France, and we are really happy that uh, a great number of uh, candidates come from uh, African countries. I think this is a specificity for France. The uh, funding uh, process uh, is very strict and demanding. Um, it is uh, obviously very uh, transparent. Um, we have already selected uh, 37 projects for a total budget of 14.5 million euros. So um, after a year of existence, we have uh, managed to spend all the money that was allocated to our institution. And so we hope to be uh, in touch with uh, a lot of you in the future, people who work in research, people who work uh, level of implementing projects, people who work with AFD, people who work in the context of uh, French cooperation. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I will uh, give the floor, leave the floor for the first panel. And I want to start by welcoming um, a member of our board, Jean-Michel Severino, who himself uh, has uh, shown that uh, the French politics could be very innovative uh, when uh, needed. Um, and he did this uh, namely uh, as, uh, let's say, uh, chairman or boss, should I say, of uh, AFD. And so with this, uh, once again, I wish you a very warm welcome, and I'm very happy uh, to be uh, with you here this afternoon. Bonjour à tous. Je suis Claire Bernard. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Claire uh, Bernard. I'm uh, Deputy Director of uh, FID. Thank you, Esther, for this very kind uh, introduction, very inspiring. I'm very happy to introduce the, few, the first panel, Financing Innovation at the Early Stages of Their Life. So, see the structuring towards impact. Um, so, as Esther said it, we have a certain number of stages uh, when we fund projects. And so, this first panel will uh, focus on the first stage, which is the stage during which we prepare grants. It is uh, so this is the first stage and then the, the second stage, which is the pilot stage during which we test um, the various projects. And so we will discuss this with um, Jean-Michel Severino, who is chairman of the supervisory board uh, of INAP. And uh, he's also a member of the management board of FID. He will um, sit on this panel with four other people. Uh, Pelkins Adeno, who is founder and CEO of Casvita, Sarah Benlefki, who is co-founder and CEO of BMTNC, Omar Zang, who is chair of Social Broker, and Marie-Alix Deputer, who is founder and president of Blue Mind Foundation. You have the floor. Right. Hello, everyone. So, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be back at AFD, especially after the presentation by Esther. But uh, I must say that I would have been extremely proud and happy if at the time uh, when I worked for this uh, wonderful institution, uh, FEED had existed. And at the time, we could have helped uh, develop uh, amazing initiatives, a bit like the one we'll be discussing this afternoon. And I won't be talking because uh, uh, I would like to um, save this time for our panelists, these uh, great um, innovators who travel from far away to, to share their experience. There is one thing which is very important in the uh, feed, which is that uh, the this uh, innovation uh, experience shows a uh, long-term sustainability uh, and the sustainability can be acquired in two ways either uh, this uh, sustainability is proven uh, through uh, uh, the uh, a market and here we have a financial market 
or of course there is a private community uh, within the framework of uh, a, an action philanthropic uh, action or a government or a public entity which is sufficiently convinced to bear on the long term uh, an activity without financial uh, return but whose uh, societal impact will be high and uh, we we have a, a note of hope here because uh, here we are at a very uh, early stage of the development of these uh, um, entities and this is why we are collaborating but we hope that uh, thanks to their um, experience they will prove that their ideas are, are, are brilliant and excellent for those who don't know them yet these are remarkable ideas but as mentioned uh, by Esther uh, well, not so long ago uh, moving uh, to uh, the real world but especially scaling up is uh, a tricky uh, and I'm very proud to, to note that amongst the pun panelists we have two companies which were supported by IEP my own company within a mindset which was not uh, so much assessment of innovation but of financial solvability uh, financial solvency and so this is uh, um, uh, something which is uh, very very relevant now without any further ado I would like to give the floor to our friends and they've got a difficult chore. They must stick to five minutes to present an adventure they could talk about for, for months, if not years, because they've been living with them for, for months and years. So please uh, respect this rule. Please respect the rule and uh, stick to it. And therefore, we will have enough time for a couple of questions for a Q&A session, which will enable us to clarify a certain number of uh, uh, things I have in mind and then I hope that we will have a few minutes to uh, satisfy the curiosity of the room. There is no protocol and uh, therefore I will just take you as, as the presentations uh, come and we will start with a company and uh, this wasn't done on purpose but uh, YP uh, supported uh, them, and uh, uh, I would like to, to mention Casvita, which is managed and and promoted um, uh, by Pelskins Ajano and uh, operates in uh, Cameroon. So you now have the mic. Five minutes to go, and you have microphones just in front of you, which normally should work. Yes, good. Well, hi, my name is Pelkins. And I would like to start uh, saying that I spent nine years in the US and so my French is a little bit rusty, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll manage. I'm co-founder of uh, uh, Casvita, which is a food company with a very simple goal, which is to <clears throat> create prosperity for um, uh, manioc um, producers, uh, cassava producers. And so I left Cameroon, I went to uh, the US where I got uh, um, uh, an MA uh, at the MAT and then uh, a BA at the MIT and a BA and an MA uh, in, uh, at, um, in, at the Harvard University. But the problem is that uh, cassava is uh, a, a root vegetable which is extremely important in the uh, life of, of farmers, especially uh, in the tropical areas. But uh, three days after harvest, it starts to deteriorate. And uh, this is uh, why most uh, farmers live in poverty and they cannot uh, uh, pay for health care or education. And so we've uh, invented a new technology to increase uh, the life span of uh, uh, cassava from three days to 18 months and as a consequence we can increase uh, farmers income uh, improve farmers income by 400 percent uh, whooping 400 percent and um, 95 percent of our farmers are women and so as we increase their revenue we also empower them in their communities. 
Now, the idea of this uh, subsidy uh, is to launch a different technology uh, for coordination because what we saw was that we were limited uh, with biotechnology especially when you uh, manage a large community and so we've developed a technology for coordination in order to facilitate uh, our, uh, our interactions with families and so this preparation uh, subsidy should help us launch the pilot project uh, but also test the uh, coordination technology that we've tested as you can see we have a very young team and we are eager to see how this is going to pan out thank you very much once again and i'm really uh, so happy to be with you today and i think you've won the speed award uh, and now I'd like to give the floor to Sarah Benavki, uh, and I hope uh, she will be as uh, quick as you. Okay, I'm just waiting for my slide. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sarah Benavki, CEO and co-founder of Pentac, and I'm uh, uh, an engineer from Lemin School of Industry in Morocco. Our project is in line with food safety, and the idea is to meet the challenge of feeding the planet uh, of 9 billion in 2015. Every year, one third of production is lost or wasted, which represents a loss of $1,000 billion and uh, 4 gigaton uh, CO2. And uh, Africa corresponds of 30% of uh, world production, and this is a continent where 250,000 uh, people are hungry. Uh, so there is a, a, a loss also in rare revenue, such as water and energy, <clears throat> which impacts uh, directly uh, smallholders that see their revenues uh, reduced by 15%. And this loss is due to the lack of access to refrigeration technology and the cold chain is not uh, developed sufficiently. So what do you do when you don't have electricity? In Africa, over 50% of the population does not have access to electricity and the um, planet is weathering a climate change and uh, uh, a crisis and we cannot use a diesel technology. So this is where we use uh, uh, our technology. We have a, an off-grid solar technology. Now, when you think uh, solar, we all think about uh, uh, a photovoltaic, but uh, we use a, a thermal uh, a technology uh, which uh, required a lot of R&D and capital, but uh, we have several advantages in terms of uh, energy efficiency, maintenance and cost. <clears throat> because this is a real barrier, especially in developing countries. The first model is for storage of fruit and vegetable. We have a capacity of six tons and a temperature of four degrees, uh, five degrees Celsius, which enabled to extend the uh, uh, lifespan of harvest from five to 20 days. So here we take part in improving livelihoods of farmers, but also we fight poverty in doing so with one single uh, Pentac unit gives access to refrigerators to 50 farmers. It enables us to soar, uh, to increase revenue by 60%. There's also a non-neglectable impact on climate change because uh, with uh, one single unit, we can save 237 tons of CO2 emissions. And this is how we can use deep tech uh, for uh, mankind. I think I was quick. Yes, uh, perfect. So we have a very performing team, so thank you very much. And I believe that uh, we have all uh, noted how complementary your solutions are in the uh, food industry, very performing. I would now like to give the floor to Omer Zung, who is the chairman of Broker, Social Broker. Yes, yeah, Social Broker, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, thank you very much. Um, so in many developing countries we have a, a very low social protection system especially for the uh, uh, poorest and next to this uh, there are small uh, associations that uh, come together uh, uh, very small in size and they 
have a kind of embryos of social uh, protection. And we are trying to bring together <clears throat> these uh, small networks for them to mutualize and have more predictive sources of, of financing. So very briefly, I would like to uh, tell you what uh, 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 Tantin is. Uh, uh, Tantin is, is an informal association. They are very much present in uh, countries, uh, in poor countries. They come together um, from very difficult social backgrounds and they are small in size. Normal, we know how these uh, Tantins uh, work. We know uh, the relative credit system of uh, Tantins. We know uh that uh, a certain number of banks uh, uh, use this system uh but we don't less uh, know so much the uh, support fund which is a kind of insurance and that enables the members uh, of, uh to protect themselves socially so how does this work this fund well the members of the tontin have a, a common fund which uh, must remain full uh, throughout its lifespan and this uh, uh, promises a compensation to any member who uh, has a, a casualty. Often they, they are fatalities, but uh, when uh, a member uh, is uh, impacted uh, by, uh, by an accident, then he can benefit from this fund. And a certain number of members who have more difficulties uh, to compensate for this fund and so uh, this creates inequalities and sometimes there's a risk of social exclusion and this is where uh, our solution of uh, Tontinere comes into place and I'm going to try to present you with a fictitious uh, cash flow where we see the uh, people who subscribe here they uh, pay uh, a premium of $50 and they get mobilized with uh, their uh, for, for two accidents but as of the third accident, uh, uh, Tontinerie would act as a reinsurer. So here the Tontinar, who had only two accidents, would have to call upon uh, their members. Uh, but the Tontinerie know that there were three accidents and uh, they would only call upon the members uh, twice, but for the third accident, Tontinier uh, comes into place. If you take Tontinier, they had four accidents and uh, members would have to pay uh, another uh, two uh, fees. So we believe that this solution, just like any uh, social protection solution or social insurance system, enables to, uh, to reduce inequalities and exclusion. And uh, thanks to these uh, informal uh, networks, we can provide uh, valid support. I did not mention uh, a certain uh, uh, other aspects, but this is basically the idea. But you still have a minute to go, if you like. Okay, so this is, is a challenge because we, uh, of course, uh, try to do a randomized test and uh, you know to see if we could reduce inequalities and there are a certain number of uh, uh, scientific solutions uh, to solve uh, th this question even if we don't know the, the population so using the mark of chain we can have a number which would be representatives of uh, the uh, tontines that would uh, uh, take part in this uh, solution on a given geographical area so if we take a, a random test uh, we would have a, a, a number sample and this would enable us to uh, allocate the participation uh, of an intervention group which would be receiving uh, the compensation of Fontinere and we would have a control group uh, which wouldn't with a, a cash benchmarking and therefore uh, that way we hope that we'll be able to assess the efficiency of our method. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we can see uh, a new example of uh, financial I imagination to fight poverty. And my last slide also leads us to uh, what the feed does, and which is very interesting, which is to try and appreciate and, uh, uh, and understand uh, impact and assess impact. And now I'd like to give the floor to 
Um, Marie-Alix de Buter, uh, who is a chairman of a Blue Mind Foundation. Uh, mental health is extremely important, and this is something we wanted to share with you all. Nothing is possible without health, and I know this because 10 years ago, my husband was assassinated when I was uh, pregnant, four months, and this is how I uh, started uh, a depression. And uh, I managed to overcome this because uh, I was supported by uh, my, my, my loved ones, but also by therapists. Uh, therapy saved my life. And so the idea for us at Blue Mine Foundation is to uh, make uh, healthcare available to everyone in Africa. And so today, the figures of the uh, OMS consider that 100,000 people are suffering from mental health diseases. Uh, six million are women, uh, women under 25 suffering from depression. When you are facing such an important figure, the question we could ask ourselves is what to do, uh, because otherwise you can quickly feel overwhelmed. And so the question for us was to say, well, we are going to ask women, the people concerned. And so we asked over uh, 714 women in seven countries and two continents, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast and Togo, and these women uh, acknowledged that they talk, talk to their hairdresser. And this is how Heal by Hair uh, arrived. Um, the idea of the Heal by Hair, it's a three-day training uh, which enables to uh, uh, train uh, hairdressers in, and give them uh, the, the tools uh, for first aid, mental first aid, um, because women uh, acknowledge that they talk to the hairdresser and when 67% uh, say that yes, if a hairdresser was trained on uh, mental health issues, this would be a good opportunity for them to privilege this hairdresser. Well, uh, well, women talk to the hairdresser and so let's uh, uh, train hairdressers. And um, thanks to the support of uh, FEED, and this is what we wanted to talk about over here, Esther Duflo mentioned this uh, quite uh, uh, correctly at the being very often in these uh, support programs uh, for uh, development in uh, international solidarity. There are so many criteria. There is a set of criteria that uh, stops you from trying and innovating. So today we've trained the first cohort of uh, hairdressers who are uh, committed uh, in their communities and who have this potential to raise the awareness of over 8,000 women. Uh, and the first thing before you access healthcare is to be able to use the right words without uh, stigmatizing. And so in uh, uh, Africa, the fact that you talk about mental health is a taboo. Uh, and so you do not access healthcare if you do not access, accept the fact that uh, mental health is health. And with the feed and that support, we will be able to train over 200 hairdressers and see before we reach our ultimate uh, uh, program of Heal by Hair, which would be to enable African women to have access to a better well-being and mental health and we want to uh, make sure that the hairdressers that we are going to train have the skills, uh, the tools, uh, let's say tools to improve their knowledge in the field and lead to sustainable change. And so thanks to this uh, support, we will be able to raise the awareness of 72,000 African women in three cities. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I must say that I am uh, touched uh, by, by your courage uh, to uh, face these taboos and uh, psychological difficulties. And uh, uh, I, I were lucky enough to, to, to face these issues and be committed in this field. And I do admire the very interesting way within which you uh, tackle uh, this uh, issue, which should be uh, um, uh, which requires mobilization and uh, mental health is what uh, costs over 40 billion euros a year in France and uh, there is a big, big uh, challenge here that we cannot overcome and therefore I would like this uh, to be part of uh, the initiatives uh, that show not uh, failure but uh, success. Uh, now. 
I would like to make the most of this uh, little moment to chat. Uh, and thanks to you, we will be able to, uh, uh, well, keep uh, 20 minutes uh, occupied. Um, now, I'm delighted for us to have these 20 minutes to start a discussion and um, I, I suggest that uh, you, you start with this collective question and I hope that each and every one of you will be able to react to uh, uh, to this. What, what do you expect uh, really from uh, a sponsor like the feed and what was your experience so far because we are here with, uh, uh, I mean, what? how does the feed make the difference uh, as compared to the other types of uh, sponsoring? Because you may have been uh, sponsored by other contributors. And uh, what uh, what um, do you believe is lacking and what do you expect? What are you expecting? There's no, no, no specific order. You've got the microphone, please, please go ahead. Well, to start with, the fact that uh, I, I knew the feed existed. It was a revelation for me because it, somebody told me, you know, here by here, I could, uh, you know, make a request. Ah, usually when you have to fill out a, a file, well, it's dead. Okay, but I, I'm not going to give up. And the first thing was to say, well, this essential point, which is this right to, to fail for such an important topic. Uh, as, as important as mental health, we're dealing with people's lives. And I have a testimony here. Every every month we, we meet women and we have uh, women who've left uh, uh, violent husbands. And so the impact is real in people's lives. And so we didn't uh, start to fail. No, we started to ensure that what we uh, do will meet support because I talked about this volume, the 66 million women. And of course, we have a very strong ambition, which is to be able to reach out and aware uh, as many women as possible to access to health care. But so we need support uh, as regards uh, measuring the impact. So we need to do things properly. And this is something where we can make progress. And so in, in this relationship we have with, with the feed, and I'm not going to say this, I'm not saying this because they're here, but we're really trying to say that at every moment, even these questions that were asked, and we've underlined this with uh, Joanna, there are a number of questions of the committee that enabled us to structure our answer. And here, this it's very important to say that when we ask questions, it's, it's not personal. We just want to ensure that we are going in into the right direction, a direction which will enable us to meet the target. So this right to fail um, is very important uh, for, for the achievement of such a project and we need technical support and it is important to underline this. So thank you very much to their feed. Yes, what I uh, find interesting with the feed is uh, that uh, between research and a startup, so before the commitments with the feed, I, I saw myself as a, an entrepreneur. So how to raise funds with venture capital. Uh, 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 and what I found interesting with the feed is that uh, there is this uh, uh, analysis, this assessment dimension of what we do and we try and see how our interventions uh, translate into uh, people's uh, livelihood improvements uh, especially for the poorest out there and i believe this is very interesting because uh, most of the time organizations um, go for one or the other but the feed is somewhere in the middle Well, thank you very much. I believe that the feed is very important for three reasons. The first is that feed has innovated in its design. When you look at the other innovation funds, feed uh, has uh, a very low uh, entrance barrier, which enabled you to finance, get a fi financing to, to develop an idea whereas other funds start at the pilot phase. So that's the first advantage. Second advantage, and this is probably shared by other innovation funds, uh, which is that the constraint to think and prove scientifically the impact of your project uh, means 
a certain uh, amount of rigor from design so even though you're entitled to fail you know that you you need the right milestones in order to avoid uh going a cropper and so this is uh, the second point third point is uh, the financial uh, input when you can access this uh, financial input with a follow-up that they promise if it's only a promise of follow-up this would enable to uh, uh, valorize uh, individuals but also to get uh, uh, the support of a third party entity in order to uh, just uh, yeah, make sure that we are on the right track. Okay, before I give the floor to Benefki, I'd like to say that uh, since you started answering to the second question I was going to answer, I suggest that uh, uh, the room asks their question after Madame Afki takes the floor. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good. But I'd like to come to the first point mentioned by Omar, which is that there is this phase before the pilot, which is very important. And I'll illustrate this with our uh, case at Bentec. So we are a deep tech uh, technology, which is a very common word in France, but I'd like to um, clarify what this means. The deep tech is a new technology which requires long cycles of R&D, a lot of capital, <laughs> years of development before it goes on to the market uh, and it is too risky for financiers and we are here in Africa so the risk is even higher and so the amount of the FID even though it's a small amount for technological uh, investments it enables to carry on developing for a few months uh, and gaining other uh, financing and that was very important okay thank you very much this is extremely interesting do we have any questions uh, yes a gentleman over there Yes, please go ahead. No microphone, the interpreters cannot hear. Yes, uh, hello. M my question is, uh, what percentage of your financing corresponds to what uh, feed uh, provided? Well, let's take two or four questions and then you'll be able to answer to them. Uh, all in one. I saw other hands raised. Yes. Yes, hello. I'd like to know a little bit more about the indicators you chose for every project. What are the KPIs you chose and how did you build them? Okay. Do we have any other arms? Yes. We have a lady there. Yes. Hello for cassava in Cameroon. I didn't quite understand if the feed uh, is, supports the biotechnology or the coordination technology. Uh, that, I mean, what is what you call this coordination technology? Okay, so I suggest that we start with this uh, very specific first question and then all the other panelists will be able to comment on the other questions on the uh, size uh, of uh, financing and the indicators you may choose so in other words the experimental performance you're trying to measure yes please go ahead so the feed finances uh, coordination technology and it's important because we have two levels of technology we have a biotechnology uh, which increases the lifespan of uh, uh, manioc and we also saw that with biotechnology, we were limited. And uh, so we have these uh, large communities of farmers. And so it, it is difficult to, um, I mean, to understand, you know, when you need to sow and, and, and when you want to reap. So this coordination technology is a basic SMS technology and it gives you a means to uh, start uh, engaging with the uh, uh, farming community because uh, cassava uh, is uh, will start degrading after three days three days after harvest and so you need to do something before the three days and this intervention uh, it requires this coordination technology if we have this coordination technology um, then uh, we, we we can uh, reach our, our, our targets, which is uh, to improve the farmers' uh, livelihoods. And, and there's also a refrigeration technology. 
maybe a word before I give the floor to the other panelists uh, on the criteria that you're trying to measure and uh, the financing of feeds. Le problème, parce que je pense que la plupart des de, de, de temps, on n'a euh, pas une relation entre la solution, la solution et le problème. Euh, par exemple, euh, développer une application, c'est une solution pour tout problème. Mais ce n'est pas exactement la solution qui est... Est-ce que, est, est -ce que cette solution est la solution euh, la plus efficace pour résoudre le problème Et la raison pour laquelle c'est important, c'est que si on trouve une solution qui a une relation avec le problème, utilisant... La raison c'est important, c'est parce que une fois que nous avons la bonne solution, nous devons l'utiliser et puis nous allons assurer the efficiency of the solution. So as far as we're concerned, it's important to have this clear relation between the issue and the solution, and because this will allow us to assess the solution. All right, thank you very much. Who wants to go next? I will. Well, concerning uh, the, the uh, let's say, the, the funding, uh, we, we have actually one of our uh, donors uh, in the room, um, and uh, it, it's not possible for me to, uh, let's say, to, to give you a clear figure uh, with regards to the level of uh, funding uh, of uh, the other uh, people, but uh, um, it, uh, it just goes to show how important uh, FID is, right, uh, in terms of its uh, share in the uh, in the funding. And then concerning the KPIs, well, we tried to demonstrate that the typo cap, uh, everything has to do with uh, the the share, uh, the, the share of participation, which would be close to zero. And so, um, and, and this, if it is a constant, and, and, and what I uh, talk about, what I mean uh, about the, the, the the participation. So when uh, someone in the intervention group, well, actually what we want is uh, have, let's say, no uh, gap, because this would mean that uh, we have the right number of people and the right approach. So yeah, this is uh, the, the most uh, important key reference in, the, in terms of execution. Well, we monitor the people who are part of uh, this or that community and who in the intervention group would not be excluded because they have this the right mechanism which will protect them and uh, and in the control group what well, we believe that there will be a certain number of exclusions who will then benefit from the mechanisms that we have uh, set up right well concerning the the question about kpis because I believe uh, this is a very important one and we need to take, let's say, some time to answer this one. Um, our approach is that our final objective by 2035 is to improve mental health uh, and the well-being of African women. But in order to get there, we need to go step by step. And so the first step for us uh, is to allow women to talk so uh, in order to do so we need to reach out to the communities that uh, we are aiming for and we had this intuition and we wanted to uh, we wanted to clarify the results and see if we were right or wrong and so uh, uh, then concerning uh, the, the, the various recommendations of by uh, WHO or WHO and various programs uh, from uh, WHO and the various uh, scientists with whom we work and doctors with whom we work um, give us a certain number of uh, KPIs that are interesting to monitor. And so, yeah, we then move to the next stage. Once we have been able to model, let's say, the training, taking into account these various indicators, with the help of um, the funding by FID, we will then assess the ability of uh, the um, hairdressers because we need uh, 
the right hairdressers uh, to help the women we're aiming for. And so if the hairdressers we work with are not trained in the right way, and if they are not, if there's no monitoring of the hairdressers following uh, their training, well, uh, it, there's no point in, in, in doing this training. And so I'd say that uh, uh, funding the hairdressers represents roughly, training the hairdressers represents roughly 50% um, of the funding. A hairdresser talks to roughly seven women every day. So that's quite a lot. And we want to be able to quantify the number of people that are seen, but we also want to measure the quality of the exchanges. So this is what we're working on. And then we will reach another uh, stage, which will allow us to assess if it's working or not. What is working? What can be improved? What should we just uh, let go of? Um, because I mean, probably some um, parts of our approach uh, are not relevant or are not sufficiently efficient, right? So there are various, let's say, uh, stages. And uh, yeah, as I said, I mean, uh, I've been working on this for 10 years. So you can count on me uh, to continue to work on this uh, for the next uh, 10 years in order to improve this. And concerning the funding, okay, concerning funding, yeah. And the distribution of funding, well, we want to train 1,000 hairdressers by 2035. Thanks to FID, we will be able to train um, 200. So um, it gives you an idea of uh, what this represents with regards to what we want to do. And we also uh, hope that we will find the, 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 the right cooperation in order to move to the next steps. Madame Ben Faki, well, concerning uh, the, the funding, we raised 250,000 euros since uh, we started. And this will allow us to work on the, the prototype. So this concerning the, concerning the first uh, question. Now concerning uh, the second questions regarding the um, KPIs, well, we look at the technical aspects of our project and to make this technology available to um, all farmers well we need to uh, work on a the right approach and so we are actually working on this technology as a service so that they pay for the service rather than paying for the tech and so we are working on this business model and, uh, and studying if uh, it is relevant with regards to the objective that we've set ourselves. Is there perhaps one last question from the audience? I'm not sure that uh, this is the right place to ask this question, but uh, well, uh, we, we promote uh, public policy. So, what link do you have with uh, the various ministries that could be concerned by uh, your innovation? Do you have any links, actually? Well, uh, let's go around the table. So what about Cameroon? Well, we don't have any links with the Ministry of Agriculture, but the Ministry of Economy, um, of regional, uh, where I'm trying to, it's the Ministry of Economy and Regional Development, right? Um, I believe that inequality is a political issue. The reason why we find ourselves in a situation where we don't have equal distribution of resources, it's because we do not have uh, the, the process we need to have, as Madame Duflo mentioned because we don't have the right mechanisms to distribute resources. And this is, I believe, a political issue, especially in emerging economies such as Cameroon. Institutions are weak. And it is extremely important to have the right relation. Um, and, and, and the relations can go, you know, in, in many different directions, but it's important to understand. Okay, I'll put it this way. At Harvard, one of my teachers, HKS, uh, she said that the most important thing for an entrepreneur is to know how 
to read the political stakes in a country. Because if you're going to fight poverty, fight inequality, um, this is a political approach. So you need to understand the political dimension in the country. You need to know who the various political players are, and you need to um, find the the right relation with the various political players. So this is one, let's say, part of our approach. And it doesn't only go in one way, or it's not only a one direction approach. Um, you need to understand this at the local level. You also need to understand this at the global level. And this is why initiatives such as uh, FID are extremely important for people such as me who work in Cameroon. As we, we have this, so this, this support, which is, let's say, uh, from a global source in a way. And we could have a, a another um, source of support from the, the government. So yeah, once again, I believe this is a political issue and we really need to understand the political um, dimension of the country. Concerning our project, we have no links with uh, the ministries whatsoever. Um, but then we are present in Morocco. We are also working in Ivory Coast, in Togo and in other uh, countries also. Concerning uh, French speaking um, Africa, um, AFD is going to support us probably in the Ivory Coast. Now, our approach is that we need to work on the best product possible and the client needs to be happy about the product. And if they are happy about the product, they're going to pay. This is, I believe, the best approach. Thank you. Well, um, as far as we're concerned, our uh, focus was to uh, discuss with the government and uh, what we worked, we tried to reach, create links with uh, the government, but we also tried to reach out to the private sector. We are uh, partners with a broker in uh, Cameroon uh, is interested in our, our product, but there are other investors that also um, uh, interested in what we do now we uh, we so we also benefit from uh, fit support right but we try to work on different sources of uh, funding and um, before we reach out to the government um, we, we want to make be sure that our project really makes sense and is solid as i said earlier on mental health is health and when we talk about mental health there's so many different topics that we could talk about and more specifically when we talk about heal by hair now if you allow me to set this in the context right today when we talk mental health well we talk about different issues so we already talked about the people who are concerned 110 million people then we talked about the fact that we don't have enough human resources who uh, recommends one therapeut, uh, one doctor for 5,000 people. We have, uh, let's say, one doctor for 500,000, 1 million people in Africa, right? Average. We are also working a lot in Togo, which is more or less the same. In Togo, we have five doctors for uh, 8 million. In uh, Ivory Coast, we have uh, 20 for 26 million. Um, so when you talk about mental health, when we talk about such a topic, we cannot, well, Human Mind Foundation cannot work without public policies and we can't work without the help of ministries. And so we've already been able to develop in Ivory Coast. We have the, uh, the, 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 the government agency in charge of mental health. Um, and we have WHO and we have a certain number of other um, public agencies and institutions. Right? And then we also work with the local uh, authorities and institutions um, in order to have the right approach. And we are going to replicate this approach in all the countries, so in Ivory Coast, in Cameroon, and in Togo uh, for now. And we see that the needs are the same everywhere. And this is the reason why we need the support. And this is the reason why I insisted on the technical support, because what we're doing right now is 
going to interest. It has already interested a certain number of ministries and certain number of uh, branches. Um, so perhaps we could train um, people in the various branches, in the various, uh, let's say, in various areas of a society. Well, thank you very much for all these comments. Unfortunately, we have to stop here. I want to share with you um, this feeling I have, especially when I talk with a certain number of entrepreneurs, well, we have a certain number of entrepreneurs and social promoters, right? So uh, financially entrepreneurs in a way. Uh, and I, I want to talk about this energy that we feel everywhere. We live in a society which has its uh, worries, its doubts, and uh, in a way, uh, sometimes seems to be paralyzed. But when I hear you, uh, I see that you ask very interesting questions and you come up with good answers. And sometimes you even come up with the answer before having, before even asking the question. So it's really great. You're so positive. You've uh, gone through very, very difficult times. And uh, yeah, I really want to thank you very much. And I think we, you all deserve a big hand. Well, thank you very much for these indeed very interesting discussions. So we are now going to move to the second roundtable or panel discussion, which is about promoting dialogue between innovation and research. So this is another topic which we feel very strongly about. Uh, as you would have understood. And it was quite a very good surprise for us in this first panel to see that uh, at the very early stages of um, a funding, so the link between research and solutions and assessing, let's say, the, the, the level of maturity of, um, of, of the project that we're going to fund. And anyway, so to discuss uh, on this uh, second panel, I want to invite Thomas Meronio, who is the Executive Director of Innovation and Strategy and Research for AFD. Uh, and he will be discussing with Frank Langevin, who is co-founder and chairman of My Africa, Elodie Jemai, uh, who is a teacher at the University of Paris Dauphine. We also have Johan uh, Renard, uh, who is PhD student in economics. Adam Afai, who is director of the Institute of Health and Development, I said, and Jenny Acker, who is professor of development economics at the Tufts University. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Adam Afai, who is with us online. Just in my introduction, I want to say why AFD is interested in all these topics. I think it comes as a result of two regrets, which um, let's say, uh, led us uh, to uh, the situation. It's been mentioned by Esther Duflo. Now, to start with, I want to say that I am really, really uh, proud about everything that we've done and the various projects that we've uh, supported financially. Um, IFD, to give you an, an idea, um, has uh, funded uh, many, many projects, roughly 180 uh, billion euros. Uh, f taking part in such uh, an economy is really, really great. Helping developing countries, uh, well, this uh, th th this obviously is uh, is very it's very important to mention that well we invest six billion euros in Africa, but it's only 0.6 percent of African uh, GDP. So even if we were going to double uh, our, our let's say <laughs> our support to Africa, it would only uh, represent uh, 0.2% uh, of uh, Africa's GDP. So uh, there is uh, a funding, there is the financial support, uh, and I talk about Africa, but I mean, it's probably the same in uh, in Latin America, right? So it's not, let's say, um, supporting development, uh, which uh, w which will be the, the, the most important part of funding uh, development, right? So we need to recognize that indeed it is Political um, uh, uh, political action um, 
and the, 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 what the government does um, in its country that will help the development and innovation. So what is uh, our role and what can we do to support development? Well, uh, given the, the volumes of development, we need to be extremely innovative. And I think that uh, having listened to this first panel, um, I think they have been a real illustration of well, um, what uh, a high potential one can be, even though uh, the financial means are only uh, very, very low or small, um, because uh, the, 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 the solution is just uh, great, the product is great. So, so this is uh, one first approach. So beyond the financial support, well, uh, there is the, the approach of the project. Then the second thing, which I believe makes sense, especially when you link the financial support with the need, it's uh, assessing the uh, public policies. Um, and so there are two ways of assessing this. The first one is to, okay, you do research to demonstrate the impact. So this is one way to um, put pressure on um, deciders, public deciders, to improve uh, the uh, quality of public spending. And then uh, another approach is to uh, be involved in the mechanism of decision-making and working with the ministries uh, not necessarily with, uh, let's say, uh, an external approach, but an internal approach. So these are the various reasons why AFD has been really interested in doing this. And this is why we have decided to host uh, FID. FID, as it's been said, makes its own decisions, but uh, we try to help them. Uh, we try to uh, support them and we try to help them, especially when it comes to making, let's say, having an influencing um, the uh, public policies. And so we will be discussing uh, how we can do this. And so without further ado, I will give the floor uh, to uh, Maya. So we have uh, Franck Langevin, Elodie Jemai, uh, who will uh, talk about their approach. And I think they will take us to Burkina Faso. Yeah, I mean, I am Gerard Jodico. I was born in Burundi and as a kid, I went to hospital three times because of malaria. I was lucky I survived, but this illness still kills one child every two minutes in Africa. As I grew up and studying to become an engineer in Burkina, I wondered if we would use the habits of families to protect them against this disease. And this is how we uh, came up with an idea to fight mosquitoes. Our idea was uh, awarded. And a few years later, we carried out a survey and we discovered that the, um, the cream that we use uh, was very, very powerful. So we decided to work on an innovative cream that would be a mosquito repellent. And so we worked a lot on the formula. The result is Maya. Maya is the first cream which hydrates and is mosquito repellent. And it is active for more than eight hours. Several studies have attested how efficient it is. Maya has been very efficient with families, but also with NGOs. Thanks to our partnerships, thanks to our team, 200,000 units have already been distributed in Burkina Faso. I've already said a lot. Frank, you have the floor. So this is Roger Nadico, who is the co-founder of this project. Oops, sorry. So this was Gerard Nadico, who is the co-founder of the project, and I am the other co-founder, Franck Langevin. So Maya comes from an insight uh, from in the field uh, that the cream or um, balm, uh, what to call it, can be used 
to fight malaria as the African population, especially in Burkina, uh, you use these creams for uh, on people who are not sick, right? And so, uh, based on this, we developed a Maya, which uh, Gérard uh, presented. And so, it's very important to understand this because, especially for malaria, mosquitoes are, are more and more um, are, are, are stronger um, and resist uh, mosquito repellents. And so, in Burkina, 50% of um, stings happen outside of the homes. So, we decided to work with a certain number of research centers in Burkina Faso, in France, cosmetic, cosmetic experts and um, mothers. And so, uh, it wasn't easy to do, but the result is this uh, product, which is a better cream. Uh, so the idea is for people to stop using the cream they use now and use Maya. And uh, so it allows them to nourish their skin thanks to she butter and it also an eight hour mosquito protection. So now what we need to do is to go even further thanks to the support of uh, Fit and Elodie is going to tell us more about this. Right, so we met Frank and uh, Gérard uh, in May of 2020, so we discussed uh, this uh, cream and their wish to carry out a study on the, what we call the potential to pay of households, so what price they would be ready to pay or willing to pay uh, for this uh, cream. So. We have a more ambitious project actually, because um, well, we started to work on assessing the household's willingness to pay and use Maya. And then we also decided to work on assessing the impact of the use of ointments on the health of children, right? So in order to do so, we collected data from over 3000 households and 16 households with at least one young child sample in the radius around the outlet, right? So you can see here on the map, a certain number of outlets, we have roughly 200. 25% already sold uh, the cream before we started the study, and the rest uh, will start selling a Maya cream um, in the near future. So it's mainly in Ouagadougou and in a 40 kilometer radius around Ouagadougou. So the randomization uh, is about having three price levels. So we have 65 clusters in which we will uh, hand out free cream. 50% uh, will um, sell, uh, 65 outlets will sell the cream at 50% of the price and 65 will sell uh, the cream at uh, its price. So um, the idea will be to work on the indicators uh, of these three groups compared using data collected during the surveys and sales monitoring. So currently the our teams are out there in the field uh, collecting data from the first survey. The first survey was carried out before we started, so some households do not know about uh, the cream. In July of 2022, we'll, we will deliver coupons. This will allow households to buy the cream at the various prices that we uh, mentioned. We will then uh, monitor the sales thanks to the data that we will have collected from the outlets and also within the frame of uh, the um, surveys that we will have um, carried out. Then in November 2022, uh, we will and we will do a malaria test, uh, which will allow us to compare the users and non-users following uh, this period of time. Now, concerning what we expect to learn from this study. So the protocol that we decided to use 
um, should allow us to have a certain number of uh, learning. So we have four up here. So the first, uh, and this was, let's say, um, the most important request from Frank and Jaron, was knowing the level of use at each of the three price levels, right? And this uh, allowing Maya to define the best pricing strategy to maximize its impact on malaria, uh, maximizing the use of this cream. Euh, Franck en a parlé. Euh, Est-ce en complément de la moustiquaire qui s'avère euh, euh, utile, mais pas pendant les phases, hein, pendant toutes les phases où le moustique, peut, pendant toute la période où le moustique peut piquer euh, Est-ce en modifiant les habitudes précédentes et en délaissant la, la, la moustiquaire Ça, on peut pas le savoir a priori. On le saura so grâce then, à la moustiquaire. Uh, uh, our study would also allow us to measure the effect of the use of the, the cream on the risk of malaria. Uh, and this would allow us uh, to collect uh, data to do advocacy and uh, redefine malaria uh, control uh, programs. And uh, finally, if we manage to reduce the risk, uh, thanks to uh, the use of um, these creams, we will uh, try to uh, uh, work on uh, assessing uh, the, let's say, the, the effects on uh, the households and at the community level. And this will uh, also allow us to redefine malaria control programs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a few words to comment. This presentation illustrates two of the goals of the feed. The first is to prove uh, uh, the impact of uh, product innovations, and we're going to measure their impact. It, it is very interesting for their promotion, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see if it works or not. And uh, we'll try and make the link with public policies. But um, of course, this may uh, may, may change uh, policies and. Uh, we, we need to, uh, uh, if uh, such and such a price is too high, then of course the use of Maya could come within uh, public policies. And so um, uh, th there are a certain number of models that can exist. And then there's the link with public policies. Uh, um, so this uh, leads us to our transition. And I hope I'll see uh, Adama uh, remotely. There was always a little fear, but uh, okay, I'm comforted. Adama, you mentioned a very important issue, which is uh, the non-use of public policies. You probably know that for those who finance development, that is the issue of making access to healthcare uh, more uh, available. And uh, practically speaking, and what we observe is sometimes issues in terms of quality, but also a non-renewal. So thank you very much, Adama, to, to explain uh, this uh, this pro project. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Hello. I would have loved to be with you right now to take part in this uh, important uh, activity uh, where we share uh, experiences. And uh, I'd like to make the most of uh, this opportunity because in Senegal, we enjoyed uh, a certain number of uh, opportunities and uh, we managed to get information through four uh, phone surveys that we carried out at a national level to document the various measures and um, this is uh, very important. And um, we are in the midst of uh, trying to improve access to healthcare. My name is Adama Elka, and I'm, uh, uh, I know Paris a little bit because I spent two years in pa Paris, and I also uh, went to Montreal for a PhD. And so we have scientists from Senegal, from France, from uh, uh, Canada also. And uh, this is one of the specificities of this uh, this work. Next slide, please. 
So, as you said, I believe that access to healthcare is a major issue uh, for public health in developing countries and more specifically in Africa and in uh, Senegal, where we have many, many policies and strategies implemented uh, through uh, various subsidies. But unfortunately, these interventions uh, uh, don't uh, uh, make it all the way to certain populations. There are uh, people who cannot access these uh, interventions, and so this uh, leads us to uh, uh, led us to this new strategy, and see how we can enable these poor populations to access to uh, healthcare. And we saw this uh, in a study carried out in Senegal in 2019. I can't see the slides anymore. No, no, we, we, we can see them, so you may carry on, Adama. So I, I was saying that 100%, I don't know you know the disciplines, but depending on the, we have a certain number of first line uh, structures. Uh, and so uh, the problem is not only financial, there are other uh, issues such as lack of communication, knowledge of rights, and so we're going to try and see what can be done and uh, that was never used. And so the idea is to try and use existing resources, uh, these are community centers basically, that uh, we try and extend the package. Uh, previous slide, please. So we're going to extend the package uh, and train train those who, who are the most in need and provide psychosocial support as well. And so we are going to compare areas with navigation and villages without navigation. And this should enable us to understand uh, the ins and outs and we're trying to get everyone involved, um, especially uh, as we uh, work on this project. And in terms of impact, uh, we should see that these populations should be able to access healthcare solutions. And the idea would be to have uh, free access to healthcare. And we need to improve the healthcare situation uh, through uh, prevention, we need to pr improve this healthcare system, but also feed public policies because we believe that uh, there are many uh, strategies, many things that have been tried, but we don't really have the solution to overcome these difficulties. And so we are going to try and implement this navigation uh, policy because often uh, women are uh, are uh, uh, well, very important, and um, we must take into consideration gender. So this is our project, uh, a one-year project, which should enable us to uh, carry out uh, a very interesting uh, random uh, studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Adama. Uh, we did uh, tremble half a second when we nearly lost you, but we heard you fine until the very end. So uh, you've got our applause from Paris. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Jenny Acker now. She will tell us about uh, another very important public policy. Uh, we've seen a, a high increase in access, but also very uh, high quality issues. You probably remember the uh, uh, millennia goals, access to education was one priority, but we note that, uh, very often that uh, this was the case for, for schooling, but not necessarily for uh, um, everyone. And so the idea is to improve uh, learning and uh, find the better links between uh, our uh, access to uh, education and uh, actual education and their results. And uh, you're a teacher, as we said previously. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. I would just like to say that uh, uh, he spent 10 years in the US. I spent over 40 years over there. So 
Apologies for my accent in French. I'm really delighted to be with you today because I'll be presenting this project. We've been working on this for over six years, and this is a collaboration with several organizations, TUS, but uh, uh, Cellhead and the University of Difao in Niger. Our my motivation is based on the fact that over 1 billion adults are considered as uh, illiterate, so they can neither read or write, whatever language. And this is a problem, in, especially in Western Africa. We are present in Niger, where 40% of the population uh, is uh, illiterate. Uh, and um, and uh, th this is uh, just terrible. But we do have a uh, have that number of challenges because we have a low level of uh, learning and uh, a high level of uh, 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 literacy. Uh, and so it, this is a big investment for us. Uh, we need to spend 15 hours a week for three or four months. Uh, so this is not uh, doable for adults. And so we see that there is a possibility with uh, the digital, the strong increase in the digital. And soon uh, we, we saw that nearly half of the population in Africa has access to mobile phones. And uh, over 15 years ago, we started using simple mobile phones through these, uh, 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 through these, uh, th th these programs to uh, el eliminate illiteracy and so we developed a, a program and we showed that the simple use of phones through uh, literacy campaigns uh, could enable uh, a lot but you must always be sitting in a class and, it, and it's not always practical so our solution in collaborating with Cellhead is to use the phone as uh, a, a way to, uh, to, to to teach a population to read and write. And so how does this work? Um, you can have a very simple phone, you don't even need a smartphone. You don't need, uh, uh, I mean, a, a specific teacher. Uh, all you need is uh, you, you, you make a phone call, you listen to a lesson on uh, letters, syllables, and once you're finished with this lesson, you receive an SMS, and this SMS reinforces the lesser letter, the lesson that you just followed. So, for instance, the letter A. And once that you read the text, you need to do a little test. So now it's your turn to to, to find an A on the phone and send it. So if you manage, if you found the A, then you you can move on to the next uh, uh, step. If you didn't manage, then you need to take the lesson again and you need to try, you know, start from the basis. So it is very practical. This is something we had already done in the US with Spanish and we did a small randomized test, but this is the first time where we try to develop this on house up. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach now is to try and develop this uh, in Hausa uh, and uh, introduce this platform in Niger, in villages, and test the different interventions to see what are the necessary interventions to really encourage people to use this platform. And um, we have about 20 uh, villages and um, we do have uh, a, a certain number of different subsidies uh, and uh, we are going to try and see if it is possible to have uh, uh, these platforms. Now, once this introduction is done, we're going to try and look at the different indicators you can see over here. The first and most important is, are people interested in enrolling and do they use this platform? Uh, does this improve the level uh, and 
do people actually use what they learned in their daily lives? And so we hope this will have an impact on well-being of households, but we're not sure that uh, it will on the short term, maybe it will be on the midterm. And so we're going to try and see the impact on their desire to pay and the efficiency ratio in co collaboration with other uh, literacy programs. Now, whatever the results, we're going to share this with everyone. And so we've had the opportunity to do this with uh, the university in Niger, but also with the ministry in order to try and provide a feedback. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you understand the importance of what's done with the feed to protect the uh, interactions and measure, measure their, their impact. Uh, because what is done today is very original. And uh, it's a shame we didn't do that earlier, but the initial rules do not uh, enable us to finance the small size projects or research project. Um, I'd like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the General Management of the Treasury to use this very important space. It was said by several stakeholders in the first panel. A few uh, may enable us to support small innovative projects with this possibility of failure. I really wish this to be not the case and we'll see uh, the answer. And so thank you very much uh, to deal with this and uh, uh, to 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 to, to uh, measure the impact. Uh, thank you very much. Without any further ado, I'd like to move on to a certain number of questions for the floor. If uh, some would like to answer them, uh, on my right, um, I see hands raised. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, I mean, I do have experience in uh, uh, the use of phones for uh, uh, farming and uh, our problem is uh, that, uh, I mean, it is not easy because there are a certain number of problems of uh, inclusivity because we know that women don't always, aren't always in control and they don't necessarily always own their phones. And so the question is, how are you going to address this question of uh, inclusion and uh, equality uh, within this context? Okay, uh, for the next panel, I suggest we, I mean, I have a question for Dennis over here. Jean-Michel had a question and uh, yes, the lady over here. Yes, this is a question uh, for Professor from uh, Dakar. He mentioned this concept of navigation and uh, he had to be really quick. Could you maybe spend a couple of minutes explaining what uh, uh, this navigation uh, air truly encompasses? Uh, a second specific question, Professor Fayon, I'll give you the floor just afterwards. Yes, Marie-Alix Buter, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, a question for the uh, learning program through mobile. Uh, we, uh, in our program Heal by Hair, we are trying to go towards more digitalization. And what we've observed in the first cohort of uh, uh, ambassadors that we trained we had one third of women who could neither read or write. So it was a real challenge for us to help them in the comprehension of what was said and especially in, in, in the assessment because the end, at the end, uh, uh, I really wanted to try and understand this technology that you use to learn and uh, uh, how to read and write to, to these people. And more generally speaking, mm, I, I note that all these partnerships are in line uh, with uh, universities uh, and uh, these uh, partnerships um, did, were they made within the framework of your request for subsidies. 
last question for uh, the Maya team. We have a lot of scientists here, and beyond this, uh, uh, the initial uh, theory, what are the practical difficulties you uh, encounter in your research? Because you're in fields that are fairly easy, and it would be quite interesting for us, maybe beyond intentions that uh, lead to dream, but uh, you say that the daily lives of research teams are not always, uh, you know, what, what they seem. So I'll give the floor to Adamara and for this question on so-called navigation services. Yeah, thank you very much. As you probably know, access to healthcare, as I said uh, previously, in Africa and Senegal is, uh, is such that many policies are implemented uh, and um, but there is a population that cannot uh, benefit from this uh, from the fact that the services are free. So what is navigation? Navigation is uh, using a certain number of uh, solutions that are available, but they are not part of the package. So, uh, we have people who take our, uh, in charge of malaria at home, and so we're going to take 50, and each navigator will go and visit 20 sick people. They visit them and they try and see what are the healthcare problems they are faced with. They provide them with support. They help them in their research for care. And uh, therefore, there are intervention areas. And uh, we uh, are going to try and see what this means in terms of access to healthcare and reduce expenses because some of these services are free already because of the government action but people do not have access to them now choice of the sick will depend on people's involvement there are many uh, very simple criteria that can be used as you get the population involved in order to choose the sick who is sick or not this is uh, quite a discussion but um, There are a certain number of people who do not even know that a certain number of, uh, 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 you know, uh, services can be free. So the idea is for us to tell them that these services are free because uh, we don't have the certainty that um, <coughs> things are going to work as we think. And um, this is why we try and help them. And so we're going to try and see how this works. And uh, this is going to be followed by 50 navigators, uh, 25 men, 25 women, who are going to follow a certain number of sick people that have been identified by the community for one year. And we'll see uh, what this can do, because um, we believe often that uh, communication will be possible and uh, continuity is important because this is what we're going to try and uh, do and it will be very interesting to see if this uh, uh, works out and it comes along the lines of what the government already does so there are many elements that lead me to think that it could work but as i said we're not sure so i believe that within one year's time we should be able to see if it works we hope it's going to work but we're not too sure and so we're going to try and see what, what it takes and, and what uh, needs to be changed. So these are the few elements uh, of a clarification that uh, I had uh, for you. And I would like to thank you uh, for your help. <clears throat> and then I would like to also thank you, Professor Barara Ru uh, for his support. And I hope that this clarification will uh, enable you to better understand what we're going to try and do for one year. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this is something we are very interested in. Why are there public services for which uh, people do not uh, use? There are public services that are free and people don't use them. And so the idea is to try and find the people uh, uh, rather than waiting for people to come. So two questions for you, Jenny, and so uh, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for this question on mobile phone. This is very important and we are 
lucky to um, carry out these pro programs uh, uh, and we've done it for many years and so we know what uh, should be done what shouldn't now uh, there is a strong uh, disparity between the regions in terms of access to to phones in certain areas of uh, uh, 90 percent have phones and other areas 50 percent uh, have phones uh, only so there is a lot of um, mm, a sharing of phones uh, within household but <clears throat> but also between households. And so what does it mean? Well, this technology is based on simple, cheap phones. You do not need a smartphone, certainly not. And at this point, to be honest, we're going to try and focus on a region where the level of access to mobile phones is higher than others in such a way that access be not a force. And we're going to try and see if there are spillovers, uh, positive or negative, between those who have access to mobile phones and those who haven't, to try and see what uh, can be done and to see um, if uh, phones could be shared. But there are many things that could be discussed. Um, about the platform, you can't really write with this uh, platform, but you can learn how to read. And so what we did seven or eight years ago in the US with Spanish, <clears throat> basically you take the curriculum and you develop, um, you know, uh, you start with letters, syllables, uh, words, and sentences. It's just like any literacy course, but it's a, a micro noodle. Uh, so it's little texts uh, and tests. And at the end, uh, you, you can reach uh, uh, success. And uh, in fact, you can uh, double the capacity to read after three or four months. So we're going to see how it works in Niger and how's that but uh, we hope that it is going to be a little bit easier and we are going to give the reading tests at the end okay thank you very much jenny would either of you like to comment or react so, um, do you need uh, to be a member of a university uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to, to be part of this? No, no, this is not a university project. We are social entrepreneurs, a bit like you. And so I suggest that you carry on the work uh, you started. But, but regarding the difficulties we encountered, when the question arrived, I remember a discussion we had one year to go with uh, Gérard, where we would try and uh, make a list of, uh, of, of all the problems we're facing, uh, so many of them, but they are of three different natures, uh, different points of the project. First is access to skills. And when I uh, arrived in Burkina uh, three years ago, uh, we, we, we started uh, uh, thinking about how we could think, save 100,000 lives. Uh, but um, the solutions weren't all in Burkina Faso. Some were, so we organized microcapsules in North, we did research in Togo, botanics. So a lot of research. And then the question was, how can we find the right skills for the right projects? Second challenge is financial. To be a social entrepreneur in Burkina means looking for problems. And so there's a need to research, but um, not only. And then, uh, well, we, 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 the, we encounter a number of uh, uh, technical problems. And uh, so uh, the transport issues, uh, custom clearance issues. So we had to manage the company on a daily basis and face uh, the difficulties that African SMEs uh, are faced with in very fragmented uh, markets. Uh, 
Oui, moi, je peux compléter avec euh, le projet spécifique pour lequel on a le financement pour le FID, euh, donc qui, qui traite la technologie Maya, bien sûr, mais avec le, le volet recherche aussi. Donc, en termes de difficultés, euh, bah, c'était le timing, je pense, la première difficulté, comme on a reçu le, la réponse positive fin so we received a positive answer end of November. And we were asked to do something during the rain season to start uh, this year as early as possible. So uh, we started with a questionnaire, we sent it to Burkina, we got the agreement from the ethics committee. I had many things on the to do list and it was quite tight. It concerns the collecting data in the field. And this is to the, the safety uh, when it comes to the placement of the population. And for this reason, we had to uh, well, change uh, our project in recent days because we wanted to, we didn't want to create a tension due to our presence. So we needed to work, result to different mechanisms. Then the other uh, question concerning the link between social uh, entrepreneurs, so Maya namely, and uh, university, academia, the research center. So as I uh, mentioned when I uh, started earlier on, so we were um, put in contact thanks to uh, Innovation 21. Um, so it was actually by chance they knew Maya, uh, their needs, they knew me, and so they put us in contact and uh, and this allowed us to work on the project. The project made sense for them and it also corresponded to the, 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 the let's say, the, the, uh, the criteria that uh, Esther mentioned earlier on. Right, well, thank you very much. As Jean-Michel Severino uh, said at the end of the first panel, I want to say how proud we are to support you, how very happy we are to support you. Um, it, and I mean, it's really great. I mean, fighting malaria, fighting um, <coughs> um, for e equal access to education. I mean, this is really, really great. And I hope that uh, thanks to our support, we will uh, let's say, make it easier for you to reach your goals. And so, yeah, I really want to uh, congratulate you for the courage and energy that you put in uh, your uh, projects. And uh, I think it's very interesting, obviously, to see the, let's say, the, the, the very interesting part of your project, but it's not that easy, I know. This. So congratulations uh, to be so positive and so energetic and uh, very happy to be able to help you uh, via AFD and uh, FID. Merci à tous. Uh, right, thank you very much. Perhaps we could quickly comment before we move to the next uh, step. Uh, when it comes to uh, step two funding, we want academia to be connected to the project. And obviously this is done upstream of the request filed uh, uh, to uh, FID. So we talked about um, we talked about social entrepreneurship, uh, we talked about how research can come and nurture uh, the projects and vice versa. And uh, well, I suggest we now move uh, to, um, let's say, uh, uh, scaling up and transforming uh, public policies, uh, identifying these solutions that could help you uh, scale. And this is not uh, always easy to do. Sometimes it's done uh, via transforming public policies. Who better than a, a political person uh, could do so? Well, we are happy to welcome online, unfortunately, uh, Sina Lawson, who is Minister of Digital Economy and Digital Transformation for uh, Togo. I see that uh, she is connected. Ah, yes, here you are. Madam Minister, you have the floor. Tell us how innovation can transform public policies. Well, hello, everyone. I'm very sorry uh, for not being able to be with you uh, physically in order to uh, answer the question that you uh, asked me. Thank you very much for inviting me anyway. So, as it's been said, I am a Minister of Digital Economy and Digital Transformation. And one thing that we like to say in my ministry is that there's no point. All right, well, there are two things that we say. The first thing is that um, it, it's not really about technology. It's about 
using technology in order to improve the human condition. And this is exactly what we try to do via digital transformation. And another thing that we say, we like to say, is that we have a great opportunity, which is using digital as it allows us to be faster in everything we do. Using the tools that allow us to improve the quality of public policies is something that we cannot um, not consider. It has transformed Togo. Now, the project that you talk about, and uh, one project I want to talk about more specifically that we developed uh, during the COVID crisis, allowing us to answer a certain number of issues uh, that came up during um, the COVID crisis. Um, this project also allowed us to change the way we now consider social protection projects in Togo. So the first thing is that during the COVID uh, crisis, the first COVID case that we had was in March 2020. And to be very honest, it really um, came, came out of um, nowhere. It really was um, something of a nuclear bomb. You see, it, we really wondered how we would be able to manage um, to contain such a catastrophe. We saw um, on TV what was happening in Italy and we really were very worried. So one of the issues that we were faced with was how can we support, how can we make sure that in fighting the pandemic, uh, we would not lead our country back into extreme poverty because we saw that what had worked uh, in, in, in fighting the pandemic in uh, Europe and uh, Asia was restricting mobility. People had to stay at home in a continent where 80% of people work in, let's say, um, the informal sector. They need to uh, go out every day in order to earn their living. Um, Staying at home or forcing them to stay at home is actually um, signing their death sentence. And before COVID, uh, from 2010 to 2020, Togo had started a very, very um, ambitious fight against poverty. And we were being quite successful. And this had, we had been able uh, to, to, to be successful thanks to mobility. So anyway, with our president, we dis decided to work to 100% um, digital transfer mechanism in order to support those areas that were most impacted by the crisis and where we had to impose mobility restriction. Why 100% digital? Well, it allowed us uh, to ensure social distancing. We didn't have to uh, send people out there to distribute money. And also, we wanted this to be completely traceable. When we talk about uh, improving um, public policies and digital transformation, at the level of digital economy, we are aware that everything that we do needs to be exemplary. We want to transform Togo thanks to the digital for forever, right? We really want to transform Togo forever. And so we told ourselves that if uh, working on public policies of money transfers, these money transfers needed to be completely traceable. So we work on a money uh, transfer using an USSD uh, platform. So this means that the people who subscribe to the platform didn't necessarily use need to use a smartphone. Um, a USSD platform can be used from a, with a let's say a, a, a phone that is not a smartphone. Um, so using two Gs, right? And most telephones in Togo are use two G technology. So it was very important working on such a program for the poorest. Uh, we would come up with something that um, enabled the poorest to use it. So Togo uh, has 7 million inhabitants, 3.6 people 
have a voters card and so thanks to the NOEC project we were able to support financially 920,000 uh, adults in Togo so 25 percent of um, adults in Togo received a financial support during the COVID crisis. And one specificity uh, is that we chose to give more money to women than to men. So when you would subscribe uh, to the platform using your voters card, it was important uh, to use a biometric card because we wanted to ensure that, uh, let's say, uh, people would only subscribe once, right? So once you subscribe to the platform, the platform having the indication thanks to the voters card that uh, you were uh, male or female and where you lived because you subscribe or let's say the the uh, the, 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 the the electoral uh, database um, tells us where the people live, all right? And so this allowed us uh, to uh, help uh, people um, uh, financially. And for the first time in our history, we were able to announce financial support that the people received straight away. And so we supported, as I said, roughly 25% of old adult uh, Togolese uh, people. And we did it in two steps. So the first thing we did was um, what I just uh, mentioned, this this project which was um, organized by the governments. So financial support using the electoral card and geolocation based on the um, voting office. So we did this in April 2020, but in April 2020, we didn't know how long the pandemic oh, was going to last. And so it was important for us to determine more precisely where the poorest lived in the country. So we reached out to Esther de Flo and told her, listen, we need help because we need to use much more innovative um, mechanisms to locate the poorest people in Togo and we were lucky as she put us in contact with IPA and the Center for Global Action in Berkeley and the IPA research team were straight away very interested in our project and namely because they thanks as SIGA they could use satellite imaging and carry out this mapping of poverty in Togo. So we did a mapping of the whole of uh, Togo from the poorest to the richest, thanks to an AI algorithm and the uh, satellite imaging. So this IPA uh, software was very important and we had meetings every week with API, uh, IPA sorry, um, to define well, poverty, the level of poverty that we wanted to map and so on. So it was uh, a very important uh, project. Uh, and so we used AI, as I said, and we also uh, used human verification mechanisms using namely the Statistics Institute, the National Statistics Institute. Um, and so APA, APA worked on the questionnaires that the National Statistics Institute uh, then um, uh, carried out. So we worked with 15,000 people to do so to verify that the AI was accurate, or that the results carried out by the AI were accurate. So what happened is that, okay, what well, we told ourselves that, okay, we know where the poor people are, and now we wanted to know who these people were. And so here again, we were very lucky. We met an Amer American NGO, which is called Give Directly. And so Give Directly told us, okay, I can raise $10 million to distribute and we can use a methodology consisting in using AI in setting the priorities of beneficiaries. 
parent of beneficiaries. Oh, sorry, 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 because I'm talking with AFD, and so I need to say that um, for the uh, governmental approach, when we launched Novici, we were lucky because AFD um, provided us with 3 million euros, 3 million euros, so 4 million dollars, which allowed us to fund the program the monetary transfer rate program and the Togolese government distributed 29 million euros, 3 million um, from AFT. Right? So this was the standard approach. And then when we started using AI, uh, give directly raised $10 million. And so for these $10 million, we decided to use innovation to decide the priority of beneficiaries. So we used satellite imaging to know where they lived. And then we used the uh, me metadata of uh, service, phone service providers in order to identify the phone number of people living under poverty threshold using another AI algorithm. And so thanks to this method, and thanks to these two algorithms, we were able to distribute 10 million euros to a little under 139,000 people in Togo. So this is what we call phase two of Novici, so give directly Novici using um, artificial intelligence. And so where do we stand today? Well, all our money transfers now use or are made using the Novici platform and also using the digital platform, which allows us to have this traceability of the money that we transfer and also um, making it possible to identify the beneficiaries. And the second thing is that with a payment platform, well, the sky is the limit, see? But this I mean that, well, we knew that we could do money transfers, but we could also uh, work on subsidies, subsidy uh, programs using the this platform, right? And so this is the choice that we made in Togo, uh, meaning that we wanted to find a way to construct and improve our public policies using the methodology that we had used for this Novici project. One other thing, and uh, this led us to uh, creating a social register. So we now have a new identification agency working with biometrics, which will uh, work on the identification of all Togolese people. So we will be able to identify upstream the people who are most vulnerable in order to be much more reactive during crisis. So we do this upstream, but also in a dynamic way, because a social policy that is successful uh, is successful when someone no longer needs your help. So we monitor our programs in order to assess the programs, assess our policies. So this is what we do at the national level. And at the international level, well, many, many people were quite interested in what we did. Many countries from Africa wanted to implement uh, the same approach, uh, use the same methodology we use with uh, the Novici uh, program. And uh, we hope that we will be able to help these countries um, organize this. And we are also very proud that our platform was 100% uh, developed by Togolese people in Togo. And this is very important because I think uh, African people need to be part of the solution. The solution needs to be developed by ourselves using um, the expertise that is available out there, right? That's what I had to say. Thank you very much.
Merci, euh, Madame le Ministre. Merci beaucoup. De... Thank you, Madame Minister. Thank you very much for this um, brilliant speech. Well, um, I must say that uh, <laughs> it's even better for me because it just demonstrates, illustrates in the best way possible what I was saying in my introduction, what I see as the future of a real international collaboration. Um, all nations on the globe working on protecting the most vulnerable people using common global commonwealth. I talked about insurance during a pandemic, uh, in a pandemic uh, context, we saw how the government in this case understood uh, rapidly what was um, at stake and uh, what needed to be done. I talked about the role that the most fortunate countries or wealthy countries needed to do. And we saw this uh, namely with uh, AFD, but also with uh, Keep Directly, um, who both donated to Togo. I talked about innovation and I mentioned that innovation was available uh, in uh, the countries, uh, so-called countries from the South. And we saw all of this um, in today's events, in the various panel discussions, but I believe that it was uh, even more um, striking in the development of Novici, which by the way was developed in record time speed. It was, um, and, and, and by the way, Madam Minister told us how, um, let's say, uh, <laughs> complex it was to, to, to uh, to organize this program, um, but it, it, it made it possible um, to well, uh, get together various stakeholders to, to work with the various uh, telephone service providers um, to, 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 to use uh, this, this platform. And it was done in, um, in um, a couple of weeks, not to say a couple of days. And yeah, this example, as Madam Minister uh, uh, said at the end of her speech, I mean, this example uh, um, it has, uh, has been, uh, let's say, the, um, let's say, the uh, idea, the innovation that everyone talks about now and everyone wants to uh, or finds pride in saying that they had, they played a role in Novisi. But let's not forget, it is the government of Togo, um, starting with the president, um, who mentioned how important it was to work on this, uh, to, to, to come up or, or with, uh, let's say, the best solution possible to um, avoid locking down the whole country. And also with um, the Ministry of Digital Economy and Digital Transformation, which played a very important role. And one last thing that I have to uh, mention is the fact that research and that search teams played a very important role. I said that uh, everyone wanted, you know, to claim their um, ownership in the VC. Well, I'm trying to do this uh, by saying that, well, we played a role in um, research. What Madam Minister did not mention and what I want to mention is that fairly early on, um, so March 2020, uh, I received a phone call um, from one of uh, the advisors, the president, who asked me, okay, what do you believe uh, would be the best thing to do in terms of transfers? Would it be food basket transfers or money transfers? So you see on the 15th of March, it had not yet been decided what the support would be. And I was in, in, in my children's room, right? I was with my, 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 my children in the background and I, and I told the president that research suggests that you should do money transfers. And this is not research that I made myself. It's research that had been carried out by a certain number of people 
in different contexts, and namely a series of studies uh, from uh, Ivry, which showed that in given context, and apart from you know some places where there is really no food and where people cannot uh, buy food, well, money transfers are as efficient to improve uh, the, um, the nutrition of people and are much easier and cheaper to implement. And, and so following this research, following this discussion, um, the decision was made to a favor money transfer, which then led to uh, working, well, to the decision to do this uh, digitally. And uh, yeah. and I really want to insist on uh, on the fact that uh, yeah, this was the right decision to make. So quite often people complain about the fact that, uh, well, research takes a lot of time and uh, public policies do not have the time to wait for research. Well, if we take the example of Togo, we see that all these years of research prove to have been relevant, useful, powerful in order to allow a very rapid action from public policy or on the public policy side. And uh, if we take the team from uh, the ministry, SIGA, and all the other people uh, involved, they were so fast in developing uh, the tools. So, well, yeah, uh, politics couldn't wait, but it was possible to do this research uh, in record time. Well, because all the teams were working uh, together, but also standing on the shoulders of the giants of the past who had already provided us with the results of their research. So I think we see by this that all of this could not have been possible, even with innovation, even with the inventive spirits that we have uh, and the teams of Togo, this could not have been possible. This, 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 all of this could not have been possible 10 years ago. You see why? Well, because the, 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 the research corpus was not there. And so today we are in an era where we start to feel the results. We are able to pick the fruits of the trees that have been planted years ago. And it allows us uh, to work on very important projects. It allows us to contribute, to create more knowledge, which will be uh, useful in the future. In my introduction, I said that it was important to build an infrastructure which would allow us to respond rapidly in the case of a disaster. I think that the Novisi uh, program uh, shows that there is at least one example of this. And I really wish that we will be able to replicate this platform as much as possible. I believe that there certainly is the willingness to do so um, with uh, the support of um, everyone, uh, all the people of goodwill, let's say. <laughs> and uh, well, we can certainly combine this uh, with everything that can be done also at the micro level, at the macro level, in order to respond to emergency situations, which unfortunately are certainly going to uh, are going to, 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 to become more and more um, a reality, namely uh, because of climate change. So once again, I really want to say how proud I am, how happy I am to be with you. Thank you, Madam Minister. Thank you to all the people who took part in this event. When the Nobel Prize was announced, we straight away said that this prize was the reward for a movement, not for people. You could take away uh, my team of researchers. There still would be something that would remain that would be greater than us. And I think what we heard today is, uh, let's say, 
an example of justice. And so I hope that uh, all this will allow us to ensure a brighter future. Thank you. Lourd de tâche. Well, easy to say, difficult to do. Um, thank you very much, Esther. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, for these very inspiring words. I hope that you enjoyed this event as much as I did. I really want to thank everyone for coming, all the people who took part in the um, in, in the panel discussions, the, the the fit teams also. Thank you very much. And now we go for drinks for those of you who are with us here. Congrats. Thank you.